Welcome back to another episode of a very British space program. You find us here upon the moon, upon the greatest, newest part of the British Empire. In this episode, we need to get some money, and it might help if we got some improved communications, and we might want to go back to the moon, I think. So it is the 29th of December 1961 and we have a contract to get us some money. So we're going to launch this. This is a another Red Princess 4C um, and this is going in to be a second generation commercial navigation satellite. We're getting paid for this. We're not using it for anything else other than getting paid um, and it's going to go up to about 96 sorry 96 a 68 to 72 degrees 96 that's a crazy one so 68 to 90 to 72 degrees i'm obsessed by 90 um and it's gonna have an orbit a quite a high orbit of around about 900 kilometers um and it's uh, it's just a standard launch now we're using a craft we've used before we're still using a standard payload you know nice and easy to get up there um we did consider for the contract that's coming up actually using this launch uh, program, but we thought, no, we're going to try something else. So here we are. We're just going to circularize in orbit over the over the uh, over the pole there, around the South Pole. A little bit of circularization occurs. There we go. Wonderful. And we're pretty much done once we've done that. We're just using the RCS. Uh, I almost said RCS system again. We uh, we're just going to use the RCS just to to finish the circularization, get that burn done, um, and off we go. So next one is the bigger one. This is a navigation constellation launch. This is an early one, and it's a a constellation that's going to require, I think, five satellites, and it requires them in a polar orbit so they can actually use something called Doppler shift satellite navigation. Okay, and we're launching this on a blue night. I think we saw that in the previous episodes. This is our new launch vehicle, and we're just we're just trying it out. Just, you know, launching it, try it goes. Ideally, we should have actually launched. The, this from Spade Adam, it's more a uh, higher inclination, which means we have less uh, tilt of the planet or spin of the planet to deal with uh, in reality. Um, however, the uh, the launch pad there is uh, undergoing some rebuilding and reconstruction, so we're going to use the Woomera site for this one uh, down in Australia, which means we're going to have to put a bit more sort of punch into it. So the contract requires that we put five satellites into a high inclination. Um, so that we can actually use them for uh, navigation due using Doppler shifts. So Doppler shifts the idea of how uh, time or wavelength change depending upon the travel speed and direction of an object that's collecting or sending it and vice versa. So um, we're actually going to send up more than five. I originally thought about let's sending up six, but then I went, um, you know what? Let's see what we can actually fit on the on the actual. The launch craft and this launch craft we could have gone for a, uh, a white trident and just about snuck five on but i wanted to be able to do a little bit of stuff in orbit so um we've uh, <laughs> we've gone for 12. so there you go you can see we've got um, an evolution of the um the the moon transfer stage there uh, it's like an interim transfer stage that we've got and uh, on top of that is a stack of satellites. You can see two sort of rings there, each one with six satellites in, and they're sort of triangular in shape. Um, this contract allows you quite a wide range for your orbit. So we're actually going to be placing the whole payload into an orbit of about a thousand kilometers by one point eight thousand kilometers. That's going to be our our sort of transfer orbit, and then from there we're going to circularize each of the craft to give us our. Um, our circular pattern that we want. Um, at that height, when we go into a circular, basically 1,000 kilometer orbit, we actually only need about six craft to allow communication. But we're going to have 12 because then we can actually have some redundancy and there's going to be some some orbital drift in this. So that's what we're going to do. So there we go. We'll offload our our sort of orbital payload there, and you can see it's got a little boost stage, which is going to be using a row engine, and that is going to take us into our um, transfer orbit. So you can see there, we're very much a polar orbit. Um, this is not the perfect sort of, so what I've actually done is that we've actually got communications equipment on these satellites, um, primarily because we're gonna use this as what we're gonna call a halo. Um, it is going to go around the earth in that polar orbit and it's gonna be used um, as like a little bit of a backbone for any future sort of semi-communication system. And it's also hoped that it will actually allow us to help communicate a bit better with the satellites we've already got in orbit and use those as relays. Um, so by putting so many of these up, it means there's very short hops that we can actually carry out and it means there's more chance of those hops being communicated around the planet. 
Um, so that's the hope anyway. So we're just positioning ourselves to get ready and then we just do this transfer burn and this is, you know, not much of a transfer burn. The, the actual satellites on top of here are actually quite quite a heavy load. So um, there you go, the row engine lights and we're going well right now. Um, yeah, this is a, this little transfer stage is something we're going to develop and, and adapt, I think, uh, and probably evolve into what will probably become our interim transfer stage for, for larger transfers. But we'll, we'll see. Well, you'll see that in the future, I think. Um, and there we go. We're just uh, putting it into its correct orbit, orientate it nicely, and then we have to um, get rid of the satellite. So there we go. We're just going to detach all of our satellites, and they're all going to go off together. And you can see they don't look as though they're really moving, do they? They don't really look as though there's anything going on. Um, what you can see is they will slowly drift apart, as with anything in orbit. Um, as the uh, <laughs> if they're not attached to each other, they will just move apart. So there you go. One of the one of the certainties in space is things will either come together or go apart. They won't stay equidistant from each other at all times. It's just the way the world is. It's chaotic. So there you go. You see them drifting there, and they will actually. If you look at the ones on the top there, they're starting to space out as well. There is a slight tilt on their positioning so they should actually separate out over time and what we will actually do is we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna take that um that that transfer stage and we're gonna try and basically dump it back into the ocean because we don't need that floating around you can see the attachment points on the top of it it's pretty much spent now it's got a row engine so it can relight itself and get rid of it and each of those satellites has its own very small little thrust that's going to use uh, peroxide and rp1 to actually orientate and you can see them spreading out over time there as we just warp forward so what we actually do is um this takes quite a bit of time i think it took a couple of days in game to actually complete this when they come around we're actually going to circularize each one in turn and that will actually space them out we've got this like transfer orbit that places them in sort of resonance so that we can space one out each time and it takes a while to do it and they can actually be spaced out around this orbit. So there we go, we're just firing off its little thrusters and these are not particularly strong thrusters. So I'm not gonna make you sit through every single one of them because 12 of them was quite boring, but you can see there, there's another one. You can do another one, do it, yeah, look. Um, and they're all slowing down because the, the resonance orbit we've got them in is actually where they have to do it, 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 they have to do a dive from it. They have to circularize at their lowest point. Um, I selected that because each of these craft has then got, I believe, less delta V requirement by doing that. Um, it makes it easier for spacing them out in reality. Um, and so they're basically just going to do this. They're going to keep doing that. And there's another one and there's another one. You can see the design of the bottom there with its, its sort of additional tank in there. So we've got a few little tanks on the bottom just to, to give it a little bit of extra material, actually, because they were a little short. So these, these craft are just about on the limit of what they can do. If we'd have actually chosen to change the orbit at all, it would have been problematic. These these craft just about make it. There you go, a little bit of RCS control there. And now you can see, we've now got that sort of halo around the top there. You can see the white ring is actually the secondary orbit. That's our reserve craft. We've got an extra reserve craft, that are a couple of them that are gonna float in there. And if we get really bad spacing, they'll come into action. So with that done, we actually get a lot of money because that was a, a commercial contract. It gets us a lot of money and um, also nicely will actually act as communication sort of relays for us so this is now the 6th of march 1962 we're moving on now a few months ahead we've not done much in the last few months have we um, and we're setting up another second generation where the satellite from spade adam still undergoing work on its bigger launch pad and everything um so uh, hopefully we'll be able to go for bigger launches from there in the future. So this one is going to be a, uh, a 1,000 kilometer circular orbit with an inclination of about 95 to 100 degrees. See, this one was 95, not the random one previously. Um, and we're basically using our Red Princess 4C again for this. It's our standard production run. We just basically modify the payload and it's wonderful. Um, this was actually pushing it to its limits. Um, this launch took pretty much, you can have a look there, we're, we're pretty much down on Delta V. Once we get to circularization, most of that fuel, and the read, interestingly, the, the readout on the gauge there is actually incorrect. It actually had less fuel than that, um, and it wasn't actually measuring it properly for some reason. I think it's something to do with using the RCS system. Anyway, so there we go, completed, although we may need to use the Red Princess 4C from then on. So, it is the... Uh, 15th of march 1962 and we're going back to the moon yes um we're going back to the moon because uh well because we've got a contract actually and i get money for it in, in reality um we're going to be sending selene 1b because this is basically the, the the backup craft that was built 
for the previous Selene mission, so we actually built two, and you know what, we might as well use it. We're flying the Blue Knight One Air rocket again. Um, we have got some development upgrades on the on the first stage engines for the Blue Knight, but we haven't got those into this this rocket yet because this was actually on the production line. So future ones will have a little bit of uh, a more oomph to it. Um, we decided not to retrofit this one, um, so. That will probably be used for some of these special launches from Spade Adam once that complex is developed. Anyway, so we're just going to get into orbit, and you can see that little transfer stage there, and uh, the the final target load, and uh, there we go, up we go, and into there we are. Now I should point out the little transfer. Oh, we're burning now. I, I just cut out the the whole or preparing everything. We're just going to burn off. That transfer stage is not the one that we actually used for our previous satellite launch. The stage above that, the actual Mooner sort of insertion stage is actually the basis of that one. It's actually two of those was we used combined for our our um, tankage for the for the uh, satellite contract that you've just seen. Um, and it's the same dimensions and everything. So, you know, we're trying to reuse as much as possible. However, the row engine, uh, different plumbing. So, yeah. So this thing is just going to burn its way, repulse its way, thrust its way towards the moon. And um, we'll come back in, what are you, let's say, three days yeah three days you know as we as we leave there you can see we just put it on a little spin as it's leaving the uh, the earth's uh, area of existence shall we say and we're just gonna let it spin because then if its orientation goes a bit crazy at least it's got some sort of uh, lighting gonna hit it semi normally and um, you can see the satellite there the solar panels on the top there and things like that so we we haven't decided on our best orientation we're just gonna let it float off so this thing is going to basically head off through space for about four days, three to four to five days. Um, I think this one took us four days. We arrive in the moon's sort of sphere of influence around the 19th of March. Um, and that's nice. You know, we, we spent three months so far this year. We've got a few launches. We've got communication system up. And now we're going to go and try and land on the moon again. This time we decided we wanted to go some sort of polar region ideally not not definitely polar but towards the poles you know we don't want to go equatorial too much so this craft is heading in um, and you can see we didn't get our uh, our firing right actually our our transfer to the moon did not go quite as we would have liked um, we actually end up coming in reasonably sort of it's not equatorial but it's close and we're going to go for a pretty much a direct descent as well instead of going into orbit we're just going to go straight in um, we're not going to put it into orbit because you know what if we put it into orbit here's, here's, uh, the row engine allows us to do that but we don't really need to we're going to trial this and you can see this craft is very much a replica of Celine one air um, it's it's its twin huh? and uh, so it's, it's just going to go down and we're going to do the same thing we, we know we've got that we should have the thrust for this we know we've got the engine tech, we know we've got the fuel, so we're not too worried. We didn't do a you know perfect direct descent with Celine One Air. Um, it did an orbit first and then a descent, so we'll uh, we'll see how this goes. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, dropping off our, our little insertion stage there, we, we move down towards the surface, we're starting to measure it. Now here at this point, I should really have switched our altimeter to um, surface level not to sea level because that might have helped a little bit i think obviously a computer glitch there was causing us a problem and we just start to burn off and you see we're, we're losing speed quite nicely actually the velocity is dropping we're coming down it's going to be tight but we should be all right we cut the engines because we're we don't, we don't want to kill it too quickly we don't want to run out of fuel we're noticing delta v margins are quite high and then we're actually uh oh uh oh uh oh no 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 slow uh this this is where we start to worry because we're going in quite hard and quite fast now. So we just need to keep firing, 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 firing. And... Yes. Um, well, that could have gone better. Um, we we lose signal with the craft for a while. We, I'll be honest with you. We 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 feel we felt as though it was um, it was done for. We felt as though it was gone. It was destroyed. We you know um, we, the final readings we got were that it was going far, far, far too fast into the ground. Um, it was basically written off. We we were preparing to uh, cover up. I think would be the phrase. You know, we've got we've got pictures from from the moon, so we don't need to worry too much about anything like that. However, amazingly, um, we had one of our our orbital satellites around the moon go past, and 
we, we picked up a signal. Um, we're not sure what's going on. It's garbled. There's obviously something happened, but um, there's obviously bits missing from that craft. It looks like we've lost most of the propulsion system, but um, it's there, which is um, quite amazing. It's, it's actually survived. It seems as though the landing structure has basically been destroyed. But uh, yeah, we need to do some research. But while we're doing some research into that, we're going to launch another commercial craft. So um, this is the 31st of May, 1962. And this is very much just a, a commercial rocket launch. I'm not going to go into too much of it. Whilst this was going on, we hear that the USA has got into the whole moon game. Um, they've crashed their Ranger 4 craft into the far side of the moon. And, and they're claiming that because the plume from one of our earlier impactors was partially visible from the Earth, even though the actual landing or impact site wasn't, because the plume was visible, they're claiming for the title of first impact on the far side. We, we do, of course, um, dispute this. Um, and we, we felt that it was important to maybe, you know, maybe let the, the, the Americans have something. So um, they can have that one if they really want it. We sent a, a picture from Celine one here to uh, James E. Webb. With the words come uh, join us if you have the time uh, we thought we, they were quite like that you know a little bit playful ship with them um but that's it yeah so uh, anyway back to this launch so this is another successful uh mission for the red princess uh 4c again right at its limit we may have to bring the 5a out at some point but which she's she's still holding on and a successful mission so as that finishes we managed to connect back up with our station on the moon so we, it seems that we have actually got most of our scientific equipment running the power supply floor seems to be consistent we seem to be able to survive on there and you can see we're getting some science back isn't that wonderful so we're going to consider that a success i don't believe we need to talk about any of it i think it's the the built-in crumple zones were were a brilliant idea um I, I, we must credit the team that came up with the idea of disposable landing structures um and and so forth and and sacrificial structures i think it's wonderful i mean you wouldn't want to fly the thing again anyway would you so with that from the moon which is now part of the uh, the british empire until next time have a great one